Hello and welcome to Planet Outlook. My guest today is the acclaimed Indian American environmentalist and author Shubankar Banerjee. Shubankar is joining us from the United States where he teaches at the University of New Mexico. Among the many environmental issues we are facing, climate change is on the top of the ladder. And when we mention climate change, the images that rush into our mind are from the Arctic. Either it's the ice sheets melting and crashing into the sea or stranded polar bears to mention a few. Shubankar, you are probably one of the few who have documented Arctic in all seasons. Having grown up in hot and humid Bengal, give us a sense of how it was to be in the Arctic for days and nights. First of all, thank, thank you, Anando, for having me on your program. I also want to wish you and your loved ones best during this very challenging time that we all are facing uh, during the coronavirus pandemic. That said, my journey to the Arctic uh, started 20, almost 21 years ago today, October of uh, 2000. And it had actually two separate and very distinct starting points that both became kind of turning points in my life. In October 2000, I first went to Churchill in the subarctic, which is in Manitoba province of Canada. Uh, I had just left my science career and wanted to just photograph without any uh, other themes in mind, possibly contributing to conservation. And many nature photographers uh, go to Churchill to photograph polar bears. And these photographs you have seen in magazines like National Geographic and books that uh, include photographs of bears. But I came back with something uh, very disturbing, one polar bear eating another. And that changed my life. Um, and right at that very starting point, the impacts of climate change and the biodiversity crisis came together for me. And the last 20 years, that's what my work has been, to bring together both the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. People in India, but people from all over the world think of the Arctic as a place of snow and ice. And it has been variously described by various United States politicians as frozen wasteland, barren wasteland, flat white nothingness. But the way I came to know the Arctic revealed a very different picture. It is a place where life uh, not only survives, but thrives in all seasons. New life is born in all seasons. To give you an example, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, where my work began, which is in Northeast Alaska, is considered to be the most biologically diverse conservation area in the entire circumpolar Arctic. There are numerous species that live there, that migrate to there, that come there like birds come to the Arctic refuge from all over the world, including apparently one species, according to National Audubon Society in the United States from India called Yolo Wagtail. And I had experienced, and there is also another species that I'll mention is the caribou, the porcupine river caribou herd that actually gives birth in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, coastal plain, has an annual migration of 1,500 miles, which is the longest migration of any land mammal on Earth. So all of these combined makes the Arctic a very, what I like to think of the Arctic as a biological nursery of global significance. So that was the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And what happened uh, between in 2000 and 2001 and 2002, I spent 14 months, as you correctly noted, Anando, in all seasons, including winter. And one of the most unique work that came out of that time, one of the first kind of comprehensive ecological and cultural documentation of Arctic landscapes uh, was actually during winter months. And what surprised me the most is that during those harsh winter months, new life is born. Polar bears, for example, go into den a pregnant females in November, December. They give birth inside the den December, January and come out in March and April. In April, when the ground is covered in snow, the temperature is minus 
40 degrees, wind is blowing at 60 miles an hour, all of which I have experienced and camped with a wind chill dropping to minus 110 degrees below zero. Uh, very extreme harsh conditions is when the musk ox is given birth, which is uh, really the most adapted to the Arctic cold, more so than even the polar bears. So there are numerous species and then the birds uh, start arriving in May and June. How was life in minus 40? <laughs> so I'll tell you uh, kind of the very first day that I arrived in the Arctic Refuge and my uh, guide who has become one of my closest friends, he is Inupiaq, Robert Thompson, and I went about six miles from their village, Kaktovik, to a barrier island where his wife's uh, family kind of, she part of the time they grew up. And the temperature was dropped to minus 40 degrees, blizzard started blowing, and I thought I would die and barely made it back to Kaktovik. That six miles was the hardest journey. And I started contemplating returning to Seattle where I was living at the time, like someone. So I thought uh, someone who grew up in Kolkata and rest of Bengal would not survive this place and forget about photography. I, so I wanted to come back, but Robert and his wife uh, started reassuring me that don't worry about it. Things will get much, much worse, but you will survive. And I did, and I trusted my life with Robert, Jane, and uh, other indigenous friends who became my teachers. So essentially the land, the animal, the indigenous people, the scientists who are doing extraordinary work in Arctic landscapes in very difficult conditions became my teachers. And overall the Arctic became my university. More, more about the climate change also. Tell us about the indigenous people who live in this land. Yeah, so you know, for them, uh, these extreme conditions are part of their life. That's what they enjoy. They like the winter. That's when they're traveling the most. They're hunting, they're camping with the full, uh, their entire families. So the, the Arctic people still to date are among the few indigenous communities that are primarily still hunting based. So the communities that I have lived with are the Inupiat, who are coastal people, uh, and the Guichin people who are inland people depend on the Arctic animals, both land animals as well as marine mammals for food, cultural identity, spiritual identity. They have dependent on these animals of the Arctic for their nutritional, cultural and spiritual needs for thousands of years. And that relationship between human and non-human relatives, they consider the animals as their relatives. So, to give you an example, when a whale is hunted in a place like Kaktovik, the entire community would gather, four generations would gather, and they would offer a prayer. And the prayer is first given to the animal. That's what they honor the first, for giving itself to the community, for providing food to the community. So this hunting is for self-sustenance? Because any use of the word hunting in relation to wildlife, sends a very different signal. So same Arctic here in the United States also, same here in the United States, like hunting cultures are thought to be kind of primitive and prehistoric, but that is not the case at all. These are very contemporary life. People are living and have built these relationships with animals, very deep relationships. How is this lifestyle changing or adapting to climate change? So this is the biggest part that Arctic more than any other region is what scientists consider as the uh, kind of the harbinger or the bellwether of climate change. That is the region where we have seen the, the first as well as the most severe impacts of climate change. The Arctic has been warming at a rate of more than twice the global average. And the reason for all of this is that the Arctic, unlike other regions, is actually what is scientists call the integrator of planet's climate systems, meaning it controls both the atmospheric uh, weather as well as the oceanic currents, the Arctic jet stream, the, which is the air stream, as well as the Gulf stream, which is oceanic, controls much of the world's climate. So the Arctic is very significant. So whatever happens in the Arctic, meaning climate change, does not just remain in the Arctic. It affects, of course, the Arctic in a 
very severe way the land, the people, the animals, but it affects the whole earth. So in that sense, paying attention to the Arctic is very significant because it is an integrator of man's climate systems. So what happened is when I first went there, which is turn of the century, Arctic peoples were already witnessing very severe impacts of climate change on the animals, on the land, which I also witnessed and learned from, from the local people and the scientists. But at that time, the Arctic peoples, the indigenous peoples actually passed a resolution saying that no real work on cl climate mitigation is taking place because most of the world's citizens have not seen impacts of climate change yet while we in the Arctic have already been experiencing very severe impacts. And that was a really a key turning moment. Today, only what, near 15 years later or 20 years later, all of the world people and animals are experiencing severe impacts of climate change. But in the Arctic, that's where it started. That's the bellwether, that's the place. And so there are many different impacts I've witnessed both on the sea, on the land, on the animals, which we can go into. Your initial work on the Arctic was an eye-opener to many and also prevented the U.S. administration to open up Arctic wildlife refuge for oil drilling. Let us hear some of that story. So this is a, this is a great irony, which I have articulated in the book that I edited, Arctic Voices, as a great Arctic paradox. On one hand, the scientists and the indigenous people have been telling us that the impacts of climate change that is taking place in the Arctic is not only going to stay in the Arctic, but will affect the whole Earth. At the same time, the primary driver why climate change is getting so worse is because of burning fossil fuels. Just so it happens, as an irony, harbors some of the world's last untapped oil and gas, natural gas, as well as coal reserves. So to give you some examples, the places that I have worked just in the uh, Alaskan Arctic harbors 30 billion barrels of recoverable oil, uh, huge quantities of natural gas. And what is even more disturbing that most people, even in the United States, are not aware of, let alone the rest of the world, that the Western Alaskan Arctic, where I've done extensive work along with the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, has an area called the Utukok River Upland that has estimated, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, 4 trillion ton of bituminous coal. To put that in perspective, United States burns about 1 billion ton of coal each year. So we are talking about 4,000 years of coal sitting right there. And there are all these other forms of fossil fuels that are both trapped in the land permafrost as well as the subsea clad threads. So huge quantities of fossil fuels are out there. So accessing that and extracting that and then burning it would not only uh, further destroy the Arctic, but would have very severe impact on the rest of the planet. So my work kind of got caught up in the politics of oil and gas in the United States with climate change and biodiversity. So as I mentioned earlier, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is the most biodiverse conservation, protected conservation area in the entire circumpolar north. Just so it happens that quadrant has the highest biodiversity. And it's not just the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the Utukok uplands, as I was saying, the Tashapak Lake wetlands, these are all various places in the Alaskan Arctic. All are what I call, as well as the coastal, near shore coastal area, offshore marine area, all are extraordinarily rich ecological places. And they are actually biological nurseries. But all of them, as the irony would have it, actually has oil and gas and coal underneath these places. So the United States government has been pushing very hard to open up all these areas to oil and gas, both on land as well as offshore. And the Trump administration, since taking office, has kind of heightened what, uh, and the Trump administration, soon after taking office, uh, announced that they would like to make the United States, President Trump would like to make the United States energy dominant. And his administration soon after announced that that energy dominance would come through the state of Alaska, the Arctic, 
where we would get the oil and gas from the Arctic and make the United States energy dominant. We have fought this very hard and many of the battles we have slowed down and not defeated. You have also explored the Canadian part of the Arctic and also Siberia. How are they different or are they similar? Let's speak a little bit about Siberia. Last month, it made news headlines all over the world. A place called Vrkhoyarsk, which is, which is in the Yakutia province of Siberia, in the far eastern Siberia, recorded a temperature of plus 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, which has never been recorded in anywhere in the Arctic. So it is the highest recorded temperature in the Arctic. But just so it happens, I was in the Vrkhoyarsk in 2007. And it's not just the town, the entire mountain region is called the Vrkhoyansk Range. And just so it happens, it is the coldest inhabited place on earth. In January, that place becomes minus 90 degrees Fahrenheit actual without wind chill. So it's an extraordinary cold place. And last month, about a month ago, Vrkhoyansk reported a 100 degrees. So the climate change in the Siberian Arctic is very serious. So in 2007, I visited in November two indigenous communities in Siberia. One are the Iveni reindeer herding people who live in the Varkhoyans region. And the other is the Yukagir people who live in the Kolima region, which also made headlines last month because of extreme temperatures that is affecting them. How are these regions different? And Canada. Canada, the Canadian Arctic I have visited, which is adjacent to the Alaskan Arctic. Um, and that region is also very special because if you look at the US-Canada Arctic border map, there are four contiguous and adjacent very significant uh, protected biodiverse region. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, just south of that is the uh, Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge, those two are in the US side. On the Canada side is the Ivavit National Park and the Vantut National Park. And I have been to the Canadian side in the Yukon and together they comprise really the one of the largest conservation areas in the world. All of that is being impacted by climate change. How are they different? If you look at the whole Canadian Arctic, again, it's very biologically rich, but it also has a lot of oil and gas and other mineral resources. In fact, one of the Indian uh, tycoon, uh, billionaire, uh, the Mittal family, the steel family, they have opened up a large area for mining in the Canadian Arctic. It's a very large scale controversial project which will have severe ecological consequences. That aside, Siberia is something very different. It, we found, and I went to Siberia actually with Robert Thompson, and what Robert said struck me in a very unique way. He said, Shuvankar, I think this is how Alaska was 100 years ago. And he almost started crying because of the beauty. And I couldn't quite understand. I consider the Alaskan Arctic very beautiful, very biodiverse. But there was something in the place, the people, that resonated with him very deeply. So, but all of these regions, you know, um, not only are changing, but they also are regions from which we can learn a lot of how to live with our non-human relatives sustainably, how to take things like climate change and the biodiversity crisis more seriously, and how to develop more just mitigation measures that takes into account impacts on both the uh, human beings as well as the non-human uh, animals with whom we share this earth. Can we really escape climate change? A lot of scientists who have said that we have passed the tipping point and at the rate at which the ice is melting, there is no turning back. So let me give you a concrete story. You are absolutely right. And, and scientists have talked about it. But one of the things I want to just highlight with your viewers is that when you think about climate change in the Arctic, at least in the popular media, two, three things get uh, mentioned. And these are very large scale things and they are iconic, like the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. And of course, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet is a horrendous thing because that is precisely along with the 
Antarctic ice sheet would raise the sea level by very significant amount. Then the melting of the sea ice, which does not raise sea level, but is contributing very seriously to further amplification of warming. And then the polar bear, which has become the global symbol of climate change, just like kind of the tiger uh, has become a global symbol of biodiversity conservation. But I largely avoided this kind of the large scale, what you would call indicators of climate change, and instead started focusing on more intimate stories from the beginning. And I'll give you an example why that is so. So when you think of something very large scale, like the ice sheet or the sea ice, it's very abstract. And meaning that when someone is hearing about it, it's far away, it's very abstract, it's very hard to tell a story that relates to people, to the land, and so on. My aim from the beginning was to actually highlight the complexity of climate change in the Arctic with more intimate stories. And I'll give you one example. So for example, another very severe impact of climate change in the Arctic is thawing of permafrost, which again will have very similar impact on the global climate. So the way I looked at that particular story of uh, thawing permafrost is 2006, I photographed uh, in Butter Island, where Robert Thompson lives, an exposed coffin. So the permafrost had melted, the coffin came out, and presumably, Robert speculated that a grizzly bear broke open the coffin and the human remains were exposed. And that image became a very powerful image to think about climate change in a very complex way and oil and gas and destruction of the Arctic, colonialism, all of this in a very significant way. So what that image does is, as Robert pointed out, that this is not the coffin of a Inupiaq, but of a arctic whaler 19th century arctic whaler so immediately it connected so-called the first arctic oil rush because uh, united states was wiping out the arctic wells at a very large scale so the first arctic oil rush with the current arctic oil rush and what made that first arctic oil rush visible was the current arctic warming the permafrost melting right so these are like stories or another example i'll give you is one of the most severe impacts of climate change on Arctic animals is what we call freeze thaw cycles. So in the Arctic during winter months, which would be let's say November through May, the temperature must not go above zero. It hovers way, way, way below zero. But in the last two decades, as Robert has witnessed, I have witnessed and we documented it through photographs, is that it's raining in February. So what happens when you have a rain in February in the Arctic? So it will rain, shortly after it will freeze, the temperature will drop, and then the rain then becomes ice. So it creates a hard layer of ice on the Arctic tundra. So the hoofed animals like caribou, musk oxen, and other small mammals that actually forage for food on these Arctic grounds during the winter months cannot access that because their hoofs are not strong enough to break through that ice. So they're actually starving and dying. So I documented this kind of, kind of phenomenon where you begin to see Arctic climate change through very, kind of through stories, through more complexity, where animals, climate change, people, all of these are interconnected. So you're going back to your question of can that be stopped? Scientists say that it cannot be stopped. There is no way of stopping because the way that climate change is accelerating, especially in the Arctic uh, with the feedback loop. So the way the Arctic climate change works is that not only is the Arctic warming and then it is impacting the Arctic and the rest of the Earth, but the Arctic itself is becoming or has become a driver of climate change, meaning it's a very unique thing. So when you have the sea ice all gone and the dark surface, so it actually becomes a feedback loop and that further contributes to more warming, which then contributes to further warming. So Arctic is a very complex and unique place. And another thing I've tried to do with my work is that especially for people, I ask people in India and other places, 
what do you think of the Arctic? And the way they speak to me is that it's the far north. And meaning is very far away. It's not a place that we are going to go. But one of the ways I have articulated the Arctic that it is not the far north. It's what um, I have tried to articulate it as the near north. Meaning it's a place that we are all connected. Like a bird from outside of Calcutta is going to the Arctic. In fact, the Bombay Natural History Society, in their extraordinary book on bird migration, published a couple of years ago, has pictures of yellow wagtail, the species I mentioned earlier, that has been um, observed in three places in India, but also all the way going to Siberian Arctic. So in a way, the Arctic, through these birds and other means, the Arctic is connected to all over the planet. So what does the future hold for the yellow wagtail or the indigenous people in the Arctic region? So future is in our hands. This is why I absolutely resist a lot of social science and even physical science predictions. Yes, the few, of course, any scientific prediction, anybody who is paying attention to science, the future is grim. That's it. And social science predictions will also paint a very grim picture. In 50 years, this will happen or that will happen. But what will happen in future is in our hands. It's what we decide. So I'll give you one positive example. It's not a really a positive example, but encouraging example. So when in early 2000, when I was in the Arctic and the Arctic people, there is a book called Earth is Faster Now, Indigenous Observation of Arctic Climate Change that Smithsonian published in 2002. In that book, they had observed that rest of the world has not uh, seen climate change. So no action is taking place, right? And yet we are suffering the most severe impacts of climate change. And this was already recorded 20 years ago. That's it, today, all of the world. And in fact, all through these, the, la the first decade of this century and into this decade, we used to have a subspecies of human. And I like to call it is as a subspecies, they are called climate deniers. There was a very powerful group that deliberately obfuscated and, and misinformed the public, which delayed the act, mitigation action on climate change. Very powerful group, right? Including politicians, corporations, and so on. However, by 15 years fast forward from 2000, at the Paris Agreement, with all its flaws and shortcomings, 196 nations have now acknowledged that climate change is real. Climate change is happening now. It is not something that will happen 50 years from now and that it is human caused. This is what we would call an acknowledgement, a global acknowledgement. This has happened. And so that, but from acknowledgement to action is a very, very big gap. But we should not underestimate the work that we all do that small sets of work the scientists are doing, the indigenous people are doing, journalists are doing, artists are doing, storytellers are doing, writers are doing, all have contributed to making climate change a global acknowledgement. And that has happened. Before I let you go, you are now locked up in Albuquerque in this pandemic. So what's keeping you busy? How are you spending your time? So as I mentioned that with that one polar bear eating another, the climate crisis and the biological crisis, which uh, we call biological annihilation, which includes species extinctions, die-offs, and massacres, are what keeping me actually uh, active and during this very challenging time, as well as my students and colleagues. So last year, in 2019, May, the United Nations, the IPBES, Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which operates under the aegis of the United Nations Environment Program, released or announced uh, what I consider possibly the grimmest warning of human history, that one million species are facing extinction. It's even hard to comprehend. We talk about the extinction of one or two species, so much of art and literature has been invested on just a handful of species that have gone extinct in the past, we are talking about 1 million species going extinct. So shortly after that, we were already in the planning stage in September, 
uh, our colleagues, I convened with my colleagues a major project, one of the first large scale transnational response to the biodiversity crisis. The project was called Species in Peril along the Rio Grande, where we looked at the crisis, biodiversity crisis, including the climate crisis from northern Mexico to southern Colorado, New Mexico, and um, as well as West Texas. Carrying forward from that project, that project proved very uh, generative. We launched in April of this year what I call the Species, uh, Species in Peril project at the University of New Mexico. And Anando, you are a key member of the Species in Peril team. In April, the Species in Peril introduced an e-letter which goes out to uh, teachers and colleagues and journalists and uh, scholars and artists and activists, conservationists from over 20 countries. We introduced an e-letter which we are, uh, we are uh, releasing original articles, original art by my colleagues, and you have contributed, Anando. We have covered the cyclone Amphan in uh, that uh, devastated uh, Bangladesh and West Bengal uh, in a very serious way. So those are the stories we are working on. And at the moment, I am co-convening with Senator, United States Senator Tom Udall, uh, a major biodiversity uh, webinar series in fall, where we will look at the biodiversity crisis in a very deep way through many different perspectives, science, indigenous, as well as state level management, federal management and so on. So the Species in Peril project, I would encourage your viewers to look at the Species in Peril website. It's simply speciesinperil.unm.edu and we'll be releasing all kinds of original documents. And our goal is to offer a cultural lens to understand the biodiversity crisis, which would complement the scientific and the policy work that United Nations and other conservation organizations are doing. You are an integral part of this team. I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate you on the uh, Planet Outlook, which is a very significant effort. And I mean it in a sincere way because the biodiversity crisis is getting absolutely no attention in the, in, from the United States mainstream media. The New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, all ignored the uh, United Nations Convention on Migratory Species that took place in Gujarat earlier this year that you and I both attended. And the uh, US newspapers are largely ignoring the biodiversity crisis. Similarly, they ignored the climate crisis 10 years ago. They are doing the same thing for the biodiversity crisis. So the effort that you are doing with Planet Outlook, the effort we are doing with Species in Peril are really uh, are something that is necessary, that is timely, and we are trying to inform and educate the public and, and inspire action. Thank you, Shubankar. Always a pleasure interacting with you. It was great having you on Planet Outlook. Thank you so much. Time.